Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a podcast about learning to learn. I'm Zubair from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts from around the world, asking your questions and hearing their stories. All before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 12 of the Tomato Timer. And today we're continuing with the STEM series, uh, STEM career series. And we're going to focus on the T this time, the tech. And we have with us Mala, who is a master's student studying digital technology at my university at UCL. It's so great to have you, Mala. Can you tell us a little bit about what your degree means? Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, it seems like an awesome community. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm doing a master's in digital technology policy at UCL, and it basically means uh, that you look at policy challenges coming from technology. So, for instance, privacy or security and how do we regulate or control Facebook and the influence of, for instance, fake news and, and things like that. Mm. That's really interesting. But you're, you've been in tech for a while now, and your, like, your bio is just amazing. You're one of the top 33 Swedish females in tech. That's that's fabulous. And you were also a venture capitalist. Could you tell us a little bit about what venture capital is and how it all works and what your involvement was? Yes, of course. Yes, yeah, so I've been involved with the with the startup ecosystem for the past five years or so in, in various role and, and engagement. Mm. Um, and venture capital is basically a form of of private equity, which means that you invest cash in exchange for ownership in a company. Yeah. Um, this is usually in, in tech businesses at very early stage. And the plan is to then invest a lot of money from the beginning so that they can grow uh, big very, very fast. And um, so that's actually what venture capital is. So you invest in yeah. what we call today, I guess, startups. It's a bit of a buzzword, but but young companies. Mm. And specifically, what was your because yours, your venture capital is a bit different, right? How did how did yours focus and how were you involved with it? So first I can sort of uh, describe how I how I even got into the space because it's very different. Each sort of yeah. VC investor comes into the, the industry in very different different perspectives. So um, when I was studying for my bachelor's degree in Sweden, uh, I was involved with a student organization focusing on entrepreneurship. Uh, and at the time I felt a bit sort of mm-hmm. excluded from the real world uh, and I wanted to expand my network at the time. So I decided to start a blog where I interviewed founders just to get to know them and hear about their sort of um, stories and, and experienced starting companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this blog later led me to a freelance job for Danske Bank, which is a Nordic bank, as a journalist interviewing entrepreneurs across Sweden for a new site called The Hub, which my friend Arash was running at the time. Uh, and when I was traveling across Sweden, I, I quickly learned how many amazing founders and entrepreneurs there were outside of Stockholm. But it was also very, very clear how most of the sort of startup activities and and all the capital and investment went to Stockholm-based companies. Yeah. Uh, and I started researching and, and found that um, there was this newly started firm called Backing Minds who had this specific investment thesis. So they wanted to invest beyond the status quo, such as outside of Stockholm or focusing on ethnic minorities or anyone that didn't really have the same access to capital. I mean, you know how difficult it is to, to raise money. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I decided to reach out to them and and I asked quite straight up front if they needed a summer intern. And luckily they did. And I ended up staying for, for two years. <laughs> My gosh, that sounds like an amazing story and super inspiring. Um, just uh, first of all, just starting off with this interviewing people, um, turning into someone who's then traveling across Sweden and then just going to a VC and saying, hey, do you want me? Exactly. It was a bit like that. And and I guess for, for everyone here who is a student, it's very difficult to sort of get to know people Um when you don't, when you're, you know, you're just studying, maybe you don't have too much work experience. Um, so starting a blog was actually a very efficient way to meet people because I had a sort of reason to contact them. And most people were quite like flattered and, and was quite happy that I reached out. Um, so, so it was a good, good approach to meeting people. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, I just wanted to like kind of go back and, bit and ask you, what did you study at university in your bachelor's degree? I was uh, or am one of the confused kiddos. I, I didn't really know what, what to study, um, but I studied a business and economics to have a sort of um, broad foundation of, of sort of businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't really what I expected, which is, I guess, also the reason why I started reaching out to different sort of avenues and find inspiration elsewhere. Um, it's also the reason why I joined the, the Entrepreneurship Association, because I felt that school didn't give me um, really what I wanted. And everybody has a very different experience across university. Some are, are really happy and are very fulfilled, while some aren't. So I guess you just have to listen to your, to your own sort of voice. Um, and I felt I needed inspiration elsewhere. 
Yeah. So that's absolutely so important for all of us, especially when, you know, I, I actually didn't know what I was going to go out to study at university and it was after very long. And even now I don't really know what I'm going to do with my degree, but it's, it's what I ended up studying. But I really, really love the idea about being proactive and reaching out and doing stuff on your own and taking the initiative. I want to know more about, so you think blogging is a really good idea. What other things could we try to do, especially when we feel maybe a bit uh, closed off from the real world or don't have opportunities like internships around us? Yeah, I mean, um, I think a really something I wish I'd done sort of sooner was to really understand what different um, job or careers meant. Yeah. So for instance, when I was younger, I was always, um, I wanted to work for the United Nations and, and work for nonprofit organizations. But mm -hmm. as I grew older, I also realized that, okay, maybe this is not the path for me because I actually don't like bureaucracy so much. I, I think I prefer working at the smaller organization where I can work with different things and things move a little bit quicker. Um, not saying it's something wrong with, with bigger organization, but that's just how, how I work. So I think a good way is to sort of start reaching out to people that you think have sort of interesting jobs and ask about their day-to-day -day activities, because it's not only about the, the company or the role, but it's also what you what you spend your days doing. Um, if you're interested in, in science, for instance, are you, are you comfortable and happy with spending the day in a lab? Or should you rather look at sort of corporates working with life sciences and, and do some, some other type of role? Um, so if you see anyone that you think is doing something interesting, don't get too sort of starstruck or... or you know, build this whole like narrative in your mind, reach out to them and, and ask what they're doing on a day to day basis, what kind of skills are needed at their job and and what they think is, is relevant for that job and, and see if that actually fits you as a person or if you're just in love with the image of it. Mm. That sounds really, really important. Uh, reaching out, being proactive. Love it. Mm -hmm. I want to start delving into a bit more uh, of the business side of stuff and talking about the venture capital and what it exactly means. It's it tends to seem like a very far off idea, especially for, you know, uh, some of the budding entrepreneurs in our community right now. What 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 does it mean for us as really early stage startup people? Tell us a little bit about that. And sort of when what, what could you clarify? Like um... absolutely. So it seems like if we have an idea and we're, we're thinking of like turning into a startup, we probably think that VCs are like the furthest thing away from us. It feels like they're like quite intimidating creatures you know what is it from your perspective and how would we if we wanted to get involved with the startup space whether as an investor or as part of the venture capital itself or as founders who want to get involved and get investment from them what what, what does it feel like how does it all work yeah, so if you're a founder and you're thinking about venture capital and, and like how does it work um it is important to to sort of note what it actually is, it means that someone invests money in the company and they get ownership of the company. So it always comes with a trade-off. It's not just just money. You also bring on companies to or uh, people to the company. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, it's important to note that it, it is a trade-off. Um, and I guess the later you can do it, the better in most cases, not always, mm -hmm. because the longer you have worked on your company, the sort of more established it is, um, the better position you will be in to raise more money because investors can see what you have done to date what sort of uh, milestones you have hit and what you have achieved so far, and then sort of base their decision on on, on that. Um, it's a lot more risk and more difficult for investors when they invest very early because they basically just have an ID or, or a piece of paper, or PowerPoint presentation or a website yeah. to base a decision on, on whether they should invest millions in. Um, so, so it's a very sort of risky, risky business. And I think that's important to note that VC investors always assess risk. And this is not just... You know, like revenue risks is looking at the, the team, uh, the market, the product, the competitive advantage. Everything is just risk. Yeah. And everything you can do to disprove them or, or tell them that, yes, this is actually not as risky as it looks is good. So try to, to reach as many um, milestones that you can. Try to validate your ideas as far as you can. Try to get any sort of proof that this is a good thing and that people need and want this. And that's very important. Don't build anything that people might not need or want. Be really realistic about the problem you're solving and, and that people actually need it. Mm -hmm. And when you are looking at, and I guess you've been away from actually being in the venture capital yourself for a while now but when you were looking at companies and, uh, and building your portfolio what were things that would um, attract you or you know, be like oh no that doesn't look very good so um also important to note that the, the firm i worked we were quite like holistic and and people friendly so to speak 
So we always liked when founders were honest with us and told us about their problems they had. Yeah. Um, because that gave us a sort of image of them being transparent. And we knew that when we would work with them for the next 10 years, they would let us know if something was a problem. Because you really want to know that they can actually come to you and, and let you know that, okay, things are not going too well, but this is what I'm doing to handle it. Yeah. Um, and a red flag that many entrepreneurs actually do is let's say that they don't have any competitors. Uh, and I know this is something that a lot of VC investors feel is, is a red flag. You always have competitors. Um, so don't say that, that you do or mm. that you've started something that no one else have done or could have done. <laughs> and this sounds quite blunt, but but it's true. So yeah. let them just know what you're doing differently instead of saying that you don't do and like and you don't have any competitors. Interesting. Um, I want to talk a bit more about your current uh, project, which is Lumi Grants. I know you've started very recently and what, how did it all come about? Where was the idea formed? So um, Lumi is a little organization I started uh, beginning of or, or end of last year. Um, and we provide uh, grants, smaller grants, so 100 to 200 pounds to cover for um, costs related to hobbies or ideas such as an Adobe subscription or a mic or um, a website or, or a course or TOEFL test or anything you might need. <laughs> Uh, and my initial plan was actually to start a, a larger fund where I could um, sponsor people's unpaid internship. But I realized that I needed a bit too much money. So I, I guess I kind of failed with it. But instead of, of seeing it as a failure, I tried to mm -hmm. see what I could do with the little money I, I succeeded to, to get. Um, and I decided to create a little smaller grant instead to, to fund people's side projects. Um, when I was studying, I, I did a lot of sort of freelance job, like a freelance photographer and stuff like that. And I always had these annoying small costs like hard drives or Dropbox subscriptions that I didn't really afford at the time, but I had to had to buy them. So I thought about that when I started Lumi of, of how can you sort of ease people into spending more time on their hobbies and side projects. Yeah. Can I just give a shout out to Lumi Grants and, and Mala? Because um, the, the amazing sound quality you guys are hearing since our upgrade has been thanks to a grant that has been provided by them. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I think <laughs> we've uh, collectively heard back that uh, the, the episode quality has definitely in, improved in, 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 in its sound. This is I love this. <laughs> so uh, I want to talk a bit more about this. So it's actually so important. And I've realized that so many times that, you know, there's there's obviously the fear of starting something new and and that's always stifling for young budding entrepreneurs or you know just people who want to do something new but there's also these little costs and it's such an amazing idea to have not huge amounts of money but even the small parts of money that can you know just motivate you catalyze your your efforts into starting something new so it was it was the perfect idea i, I loved it um to, how how do you imagine it growing and and what are you planning to do next with it so now I've had, um, I just sort of closed, I guess, the first round of, of applicants um, and I'm planning on, on raising more money. This was the sort of first trial uh, time. Mm -hmm. Now I have some testimonials and case studies and, and I've funded um, individuals from uh, many different sort of backgrounds and countries. So I'm hoping this can help me into raising more money and, and open up for a new application round as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, I have a quite, I guess, relaxed approach to it. Um, I'm a little bit like, okay, every time I have some extra time on my hands, I can spend some time on this. Um, but I don't have a fixed date to when I need yeah. to open the next round or anything like that, because it's just me and then I, <laughs> I make the decisions and, and that feels very, very nice, actually. Yeah, actually, that builds on to a, a question we had from the from this from the students. They, one of them asked, "How were you managing your time as a student and an entrepreneur?" Because uh, even though it's a grant organization, it's still uh, it's still a startup in some in lots of ways, right? Of course. Um, to be honest, right now I feel quite peaceful in my life. I, I don't struggle too much with with the balance. Uh, I'm also 25, so maybe it comes with age, but. When I, <laughs> I'm old. When I was doing my undergrad, though, uh, I was like terrible at time management. I was always working part-time jobs. I was studying full-time. I was engaged in these student unions and I worked as a freelance photographer and whatnot. It was a lot of fun, but I also lost focus because um, as probably many of you have experienced, sometimes when you do everything, you end up doing nothing. Uh, I still struggle with this a little bit, but I have become a lot better. Um, <laughs> I guess it's really decide, um, important to decide what's what's really important in, in the long run and critically assess whether all the things that you're doing really are crucial and if they will matter in a few years' time. Often, I, I, I feel like you feel like you're, the things you're doing and the activities you're doing are very, very important and no one else can do them but you. 
but actually that is not true. So mm-hmm. reassess your, your priorities and see what is actually actually important and, and what they can lead to. Um, so saying no and, and be wary of your, your energy. Yeah, conserving your energy. Um, actually, you've you mentioned it a few times now, and it was really interesting to read it bio at the end of um, all these tech things and, and all your kind of startup stuff. You said that you were a wedding photographer or worked as in, in that kind of freelance area. Tell us a little bit about that. So um, I love photography and, and I started to shoot when I was a kid, just like travel photos. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when I was 15, I started to shoot events and parties at my, my school. Um, and this was to get some extra cash. Um, so I just continued to do so throughout universities. It was quite um easy approach. I didn't do much marketing at all. I was quite lucky because I, I shot one party and then every time someone had a party at my school, um, like a, a big graduation party or, or something that the school arranged, yeah. they just asked me because they didn't know anyone. And um, I, so I was quite lucky with that. And about three years ago, I started shooting weddings and and I, now I do that every summer, maybe like five or six wedding per season. And and it's really nice. It's a really good good side, side hustle and I hope I can do it for, for a long time moving forward. So it was a hobby that turned into into a job. Nice. And and what do you think about that kind of approach? Um, having something because everything else you do is pretty heavy in terms of tech, right? Um, this seems a, a lot more of a yeah, yeah. a creative approach. A more so. How does that how does that help you balance stuff? It does I mean I, I I think I I am quite creative in the deep <laughs> deep arts, but uh, it's very important to me. I feel like this is really like my project and, and my thing and um it's really a chance to sort of express um like feelings through photography so when you're at a wedding you really just capture a story their love story and what the day looks like and the experience and i feel like that's a very liberating uh way and and it's a very nice way of sort of working in sort of real life and and capturing what you see in front of you rather than through the screen so it's very nice and, and important to me it sounds very beautiful. Um, I just wanted to, um, we we tend to have, uh, since the, we relaunched the podcast, mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately, we do always have a few uh, COVID-19 questions, <laughs> um, but we it, it's always good to, you know, have some thoughts about it. Tell me a bit more about um, how you're feeling about Sweden not closing its school or imposing a kind of lockdown uh, yeah. compared to the rest of the world. I mean, it first thought is just crazy. So for those of you who don't know, Sweden is, is navigating through this crisis rather rather uniquely. It's taking, I guess, a more relaxed approach. Um, mm-hmm. They close school for kids 16 and over, and they encourage people from working from home. But a lot of restaurants and bars are open, and I see all my friends on Instagram still hanging out on bars and, and doing things. Mm-hmm. Um, it does make me worry. Um, while I do understand how they also choose not to close down everything, yes, that also comes with great risks. Of course. And I guess they base their decision on the fact that a lockdown tires the system out, and it might be better to introduce measures at very specific intervals and run them as short as possible. And I think this is uh, possible only in Sweden because it's such a small country. Absolutely. Um, and it also has a long track record of sort of voluntary agreements and Generally, people love rules and they tend to follow guidelines quite well. So I'm hoping people will do as well. Um, sometimes I think Sweden shouldn't always go for the neutrality options, as they often do. But I guess I have to trust the government to do the right thing. And and we'll see if this is right or whether it turns out to be just a very ugly experiment. <laughs> uh, well, we hope, we wish all the best for yeah. the whole world, really, at this stage. Um there's another bit of um, so talking about the economy and specifically in the startup ecosystem. How, what are we going to be doing in terms of founders, entrepreneurs, um, and venture capitals as well? Uh, in big investment bodies, are how will they navigate this time during and post COVID? Who knows? But um, in terms of of uh, venture capital, so I don't think they will be too affected. They might they might have a less like a bit fewer companies to choose from, I guess, as some companies will have to force down or, or re- rethink their their business. But usually, technology is quite like stable. When, even though the economy is 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 worse and, and is bad, uh, technology tend to stay um, quite strong. Um, it's not as correlated to to other uh, to the economy as other industries. Um, yeah. But as we've seen and as you have experienced, hands on. Um, this corona outbreak have significantly impact entrepreneurs and small businesses and the smaller companies are always the most sensitive ones as they don't have the same resources as big corporations 
Um, so we will see a lot of companies shutting down and then probably a lot of people being more reluctant to starting new, new businesses in, in a weaker economy. But generally, technology tends to be a little bit better, I guess, um, than, than other industries. Mm -hmm. and, and kind of following on on the technology aspect of things, um, how is, and I, I, being a student in technology policy, how is it all changing the, the, the definition, I guess, of digital policy? And, and is, it, is our multinational companies favoring the way the technology policies are being written or affecting it in any way? A very interesting question. So to me, technology policy is um, like guidelines and rules for how we should control and design or, or influence um, the emergence of, of new technologies. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like many people tend to see it as this linear, powerful source which cannot be influenced. You know, we say things like, oh, technology will steal our jobs or AI will take over the world. And some things might be true, but I also believe that we have the power to shape them and decide whether we should accept AI to take over the world or not. Mm -hmm. And this has to do with, with, with policies. Um, and with more access to technology, you get new challenges such as security or privacy challenges. And um, some technologies might seem great at first, but they lead to unintended consequences or risks like you know, fake news, who would have who would have thought that that would have been such a big problem. Um, and some companies have, have definitely benefited from favorable tech policies or um, rather the absence of them. So remember, there weren't really any guidelines or, or rules in place when tech companies, as we know them today, started. Yeah, I thought Facebook would have ever become so big if we had prioritized these issues years ago. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've been um, quite recently reading about, and it's, it affects us a lot as well, because is is how the suddenly the whole world is transforming to online education, which is amazing. But also, um, how how far are we thinking about the privacy, the the safety of our, our of underage students who are using these platforms? And it's greatly affecting the fact that there aren't as many guidelines out there. Is greatly affecting how we navigate these times as well. It is it's super interesting and super challenging. We've seen. Um, I'm sure you all know the the video um, conferencing company Zoom. They've now had a lot of privacy challenges the last days, which have emerged um, with lots of like bots and trolls accessing uh, Zoom meetings. And some of these meetings are really, you know, yeah. they should be kept in secret. So, so there's actually a huge problem. And we see, for instance, like TikTok, you know, the, the music um, social media app. They also are sort of um, having a lot of privacy concerns. Um, and they're very important to note. The difficult thing with these kinds of problems is that they're private companies who have the sort of responsibility and accountability for the problems. Mm -hmm. It's not a government who can just shut them down or, or say X, Y, Z, because as you also mentioned, there are no clear um, legislation or guidelines in place for them. So technically they might be complying with the law because we don't have <laughs> existing laws that, that cover for these problems. And mm -hmm. um, while they also create a lot of damage that also affects sort of society as a whole. So it's a very sort of difficult balance between who who is responsible for the problem, who is going to solve them and and how we're going to solve them. And while also remaining the sort of freedom um, for private companies as well. So it's, it's a bit of a, of a challenge, really. It's a tricky one. Um, we're closer and closer getting to the end of the episode. And it's, it's sad because there's so many things we want to still talk about. But um, I really wanted a, a very holistic uh, uh, thought or, or, or advice from you because you've been through a very exceptional journey in your kind of um, in your life uh, really and you're still super young compared to uh, the rest of the world um, so we would still want to we want to know like uh, starting from as a student at school not knowing exactly what we want to study uh, going on to doing our first degree then getting into jobs and then going back to do another degree uh, how has that experience been? What are some pieces of advice you could you could share with us and lessons you've learned? Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm I'm still navigating my way. Um, every day, I'm I'm sort of thinking about potential uh, life choices and what I, if I should do that or if I should do this. Um, but sometimes you also have to sort of go with the flow and and see what opportunities that come if you just um, explore different options as well. Um, so I guess one tip would be to. Try not to listen too much about what other people are doing or what you're expected to do. Um, try to figure out your own path. Try different things and, and see what, what lands. Um, it's good to do that the first sort of years of, of your 20s or when you're young to try different things and see what you actually like and what you don't like. Um, and don't be afraid of failing and, and changing course because in the long run, even though you might end up wasting 
two years or something, it's going to be worth it in the long run. So, so try different things and, and see what, what you like and, and what goes with your sort of personality and where you can see yourself moving forward and don't compare yourself too much to other people or do stuff that you think are expected from you, because actually it's just, it's you who are going to live, live your life at the end of the yeah. day. Amazing. I, I just, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's been amazing to have you. I think um, our audience is, is super inspired and excited and hopefully will be ready to start some new stuff and not be afraid to fail. So thank you so much. Um, we love having you and we hope to see you and speak to you soon. Uh, thanks guys for joining and we will be back with another episode on Tuesday. Bye for now. Thank you. And that's another episode of the Tomato Timer. If you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week, join the Xenos Discord server. The invite link is in the description. And to learn more about Xenos and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education accessible to all, go to xenos.org. Bye for now.